Good evening. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, this is the second Charter Review Committee meeting, and we are at the Glenwood Community Center. We appreciate the staff and, and students here welcoming us so graciously tonight. We are missing three members um, who were unable to attend tonight. Um, they've received all the materials, and we'll get a copy, obviously, of the video to watch. And I believe our fourth member should be here at some time. So we're going to go ahead and proceed because we do have a quorum. So again, I want to thank those in attendance, and we will go through our, our agenda business and hopefully have an opportunity for questions and comments as we go forward, if you all have any. Um, we will start with approving the minutes from the last meeting. All of the members should have received an electronic copy of those. Does anyone have any questions or concerns? Can I have a motion to approve those minutes? Approval. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? And we'll proceed with the approval of those minutes. Thank you. And we are going to move on to a summary of the public comments that have been received so far. Just to remind people, you can submit comments online, um, comments, questions, um, requests to speak at any of the future meetings. Um, so actually, before we do that, I just want to let everybody reintroduce themselves for anyone who wasn't able to, uh, to hear those introductions last week. So. We will start with Bob, if you just want to introduce yourself for the group. Sure. I'm Bob Vitale. I live in the Brewery District, and uh, I'm the editor and a part owner of Outlook Media. Fred Mills, live in the northwest side of Columbus. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette Bradley, far east side of Columbus. Uh, John Rosenberger, I live on the edge of German Village. Thank you. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves too, just so everyone knows who you are? No, microphones, I forget. So Stephanie will proceed. Sure. I'm Stephanie Megas with Council. Um, also to my right is Edward Johnson from Council, and then Tracy Retchen is from the Mayor's Office. Thank you very much. Yes. Apologize that I'm a little out of order tonight. So we're going to move on with the summary of public comments. Stephanie's going to present some of that information. All of the uh, committee members should have copies of those comments, both in the folders and I believe they were all emailed as well that have been received so far, or at least those that have been received as of the other day. Is this working? Okay. Um, so we have received 13 public comment submissions from mid-September to date. Um, there are two mediums in which council has been collecting that public con comment, and it's mostly all online. Um, the one is the online form that's off the Charter Review Committee website. And that is, for anyone um, at home or in the audience, www.columbus.gov backslash council backslash charter dash review backslash committee backslash public dash comment. And that's a general form. Um, for, we get an inventory of their email address. It's, um, you cannot submit attachments on that. So we do have another form of submitting comment, and that is direct emails to charter at columbus.gov. Uh, anyone else that has called the city, it's usually directed through the clerk's office. We've received um, a couple of calls, mostly just information about what the meetings, when they're taking place, um, and how they can submit public comment. We direct them to those online sources. Um, in the front of the Manila folder, I think the third copy, there's a summary of the 13 public comments, and that has the name, the source, the date which we received it, and the notes, just general subject of what people were submitting. And then in the back of your Manila folder, there is an in-depth, uh, basically a raw copy of every piece of public comment that has been received on the council end. Um, of these copies, um, there were two in the back that haven't been provided in full length. They were over 40, 50 pages long. I'm happy to provide that to any council or uh, committee member. Um, their cover page and the attachment, the information is there, just the full length of that document's not there. Um, and I'm happy also to provide any of these digitally as well. Um, and also, available to take any questions and help. Does anyone have any questions on comments? Yes, Bob. I see there's a comment here from someone just asking about meeting dates and the procedure of speaking before us. Are 
I assume that's been answered. Yes. Okay, good. So those, all of the comment, the form comments have gone through the clerk's office and over to the staff on the council end. We've corresponded in a, in a regular fashion to those folks. Um, if it's just, you know, based on the information about how to participate, um, most everything else has just been presented here, said thank you, we've received your information. And just to remind those that may be watching or in attendance, you can submit a request online to speak at any of the meetings. And we're asking that that be done, I believe, the day before at noon or the day of at noon? Day of at noon. And then if you appear um, at the meeting and would like to speak, you can turn in a speaker slip here as well. And we're going to first have the relevant comments to the narrow topics that we're addressing. And if there are other comments that have been submitted and there's time permitting, we would have those presented at the time. But every comment, regardless of its topic, is being shared with the committee and will be included. And if I can add something, of the comments um, that we have received, there have only been two asking to speak, one of which we'll speak tonight, um, Representative Curtin, and then I think on the 27th, someone has also respected, asked. Thank you. Any questions or comments about the public comment section? Okay. We are going to briefly talk about the discussion from the first meeting. Um, so we had two speakers at that meeting. Um, Josh Cox from the city attorney's office um, addressed the group as well as uh, Edward Johnson. Does anyone have any follow-up questions, comments, or concerns amongst the committee members about those presentations? Okay. Anyone in the audience have any comments or concerns about that? Yes, ma'am. Um, I didn't hear that. Did anyone else? Is this microphone probably so we can hear her? Love, yes. Just so I can hear you, come up here and tell me what your question is. There you go. Um, are you guys taking care of the clown situation? I think it's clown situation. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Not this group isn't specifically addressing anything about that, but probably Columbus Police would be my assumption. So you probably have a neighborhood liaison officer or something in this area that that's working with them on that. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, and just uh, for the committee members, what I was planning was we'll have tonight's presentations as well. And uh, since we're missing three or four members, um, probably um, have less <laughs> discussion about our thought processes at this point in time, and, but plan to do more of that at the third meeting. So both from a topic perspective, we'll be a little bit past the history and more into kind of the meat of um, our topic. So if everyone wants to think a little bit more about what questions they have, concerns, issues they want to see addressed, um, we'll want to address, start addressing those kind of at the October 27th meeting, which I believe is our next meeting. So um, we're going to move on to the schedule. Um, and I did email out to this group. We've made revisions to the schedule than what was presented at the first meeting. Um, so those final revisions will all be posted on the website tomorrow is my understanding this, the committee has all received those um, dates and we'll have a confirmation of location sent to confirm. But what you have should be all of the final dates. We were trying to accommodate speaker schedules as well as all the committee members so we could have as many in attendance for as many meetings as possible. So hopefully what's left works for everyone. Any comments or concerns about the schedule? Okay, we are going to move on to our presentations. Um, we're going to start tonight with uh, the Honorable Michael Curtin, State Representative for the Ohio House 17th District. We appreciate you joining us tonight. Coming out to the 17th House District, we're uh, 
We're almost in the middle of the 17th House District, which I've had the privilege of serving for uh, nearly four years now. Um, and also thank you to, for your service to the City of Columbus and for this opportunity for me to provide some historical background and context for your uh, deliberations. Uh, I was encouraged um, by some folks at City Hall to uh, do this, and I was more than happy to, uh, to oblige. Uh, as a newspaper man for 38 years at the Columbus Dispatch and over the past four years as a state representative, I've long tried to study and report on the evolution of our state and city governments. In 2014, I had the privilege of serving as one of five members of a Charter Review Commission that recommended several charter revisions that were approved by the voters of Columbus in the November 4th, 2014 election. One of the least noticed but most important of those revisions in my view was the addition of Section 236 of the Charter requiring that a Charter Review Commission be impaneled at least once every 10 years, commencing in 2022. Uh, this requirement reflects the Jeffersonian notion that to properly serve the people, our constitutions and charters cannot stay fixed under glass, but need to adapt to changing times and circumstances and be examined at regular intervals to give citizens an opportunity to voice concerns over the structure and workings of their government. This philosophy is why every 20 years, Ohioans are asked to vote on whether or not to hold another state constitutional convention to consider revisions in our state's founding document. That we now have a similar requirement in our Columbus City Charter, albeit on a decennial schedule, is a healthy provision. The purpose of this committee is a limited one to examine section three of the charter stipulating that the legislative powers of the city shall be vested in a council consisting of seven members elected at large. I commend your effort to thoroughly study this provision, which has been in place for a century and today stirs spirited debate across our city. Over the 200 year history of our city, the question of the proper structure of the legislative body has inspired debate on a number of occasions. On February 10, 1816, when Columbus was organized as a borough, the act passed by the General Assembly gave governing authority to nine council members, all elected at large. Those council members were responsible for choosing among themselves a mayor, a recorder, and a treasurer. Council terms were for three years. Two decades later, when Columbus was elevated from a borough to a city, the council was converted from an at-large system to a ward system. This was done by the Ohio General Assembly, which on May 3, 1834, passed an act incorporating the city of Columbus. The act divided the city into three wards and provided for 12 council members, four from each ward. It also provided for the independent election of a mayor. All cities in Ohio at the time were governed by the Ohio General Assembly, which authorized cities to add wards as they grew and to adjust the size of their city councils accordingly. In 1855, for example, Columbus had grown from three wards to five wards, but it then reduced the number of council members to two per ward for a 10-member council. By 1894, Columbus had grown to 19 wards and had 38 council members, a size that was viewed by many as unwieldy. So three years later, when council agreed with that view in 1897, it reduced the size of council to one uh, council person per ward for a 19 member council. At the turn of the century, Columbus adjusted the size of the council again by consolidating some wards and reducing their number to 12 and adding three at large members. So we had 12 by ward, three at large, and for the first time, Columbus City Council was a hybrid council, 12 and three for a total of 15. This turn of the century period, as we all learned in school, is known as the Progressive Era, generally defined as the period spanning the 1890s to the 1920s. It was a period of great social activism and political reform, targeting the corporate ownership of politicians, urban political machines and their bosses, vote buying and selling, and a variety of other corrupt practices. 
Columbus, as a much smaller city, did not have the big city political machines that Cincinnati and Cleveland did, but Columbus newspapers in the progressive era regularly complained about city politics being ruled by the brewers, other liquor interests, the utilities, and the owners of, and managers of vice districts. George S. Marshall, our city's 35th mayor from 1910 to 1911, wrote, quote, the brewers and other liquor interests in the public service corporations dominated the life of the city and the spoil system ruled most everywhere, close quote. It was in this environment, this environment of concern about political corruption that Ohio held its fourth state constitutional convention at the State House in 1912, which produced 42 proposed amendments to the Ohio Constitution. Think of that, going into the voting booth and having 42 amendments to the Constitution to vote on, but that's what the Constitution Convention did. Uh, voters considered 42 proposed amendments and they approved 34 of them, and they must have been in the ballot box for quite a while. Uh, one of the most important of the adopted amendments established municipal home rule for the first time allowing Ohio cities to craft their own charters and escape micromanagement by the state legislature. Columbus took advantage of their newfound constitutional powers and put in place a special commission to draft a proposed charter for voter consideration. It was led by noted reformer Washington Gladden perhaps the leading re political reformer of the time. He was pastor of the First Congregational Church and William Oxley Thompson, president of the Ohio State University, whose presence still adorns us with that giant statue in front of the, the library. The report of that commission is attached to my testimony. Among other things, the commission called for a charter that would remove party labels from the ballot and give us nonpartisan elections uh, without party labels on the ballot for the first time provide citizens with the power of the initiative, the referendum, and the recall. Lengthen the terms of office from two years to four years. Combat the spoil system with a strong civil service system and provide for a seven member council with all members elected at large, the system we still have in place today. The rationale given by that commission for proposing the at large system was quote, the most democratic form of government is certainly that which secures to each individual citizen the right of voting for or against any candidate for an office which, if elected, he would be invested with the power of imposing a tax on and regulating the conduct of all citizens." Close quote. On May, May 5, 1914, Columbus voters approved that proposed charter. The new council system went into effect in January of 1916. Over time, the at-large system was viewed as having both positive and negative effects. These perhaps were best summarized by Columbus Citizen Journal reporter Betty Garrett and Columbus historian Ed Lentz in their 1980 book, Columbus, America's Crossroads. They wrote, quote, this innovation, the at-large council, was supposed to eliminate political corruption and ensure that every council person would be responsible to every voter but it also el eliminated entire classes of persons from the opportunity to hold office. Many of the poorer and ethnic minority neighborhoods had representation on the old council simply because candidates could afford, afford to run in a small area like a ward. Now, without independent means of support or the support of the political party, a candidate from one of these segments of the population simply could not get elected." Close quote. I think that's a great summation of the balancing test then and now over an at-large council or a council by district. The most obvious example of this exclusion of certain classes of people was that from the adoption of the new charter in 1914 until 1969, a period of 55 years, no African American was elected to the at-large city council. Between 1916 and this year's special August election on the question, Columbus experienced two major election debates focused on the at-large versus by district council. The first was in May 1968. The second was in November 1975. The 1968 effort was led by a first-term Democratic councilman, James L. Bauman, and Johnny Jones, a political director 
for then Mayor Maynard E. Jack Sensenbrenner, whose statue is out here on the lawn at, on the park as you drove in. Proud West Sider. Bauman and Jones persuaded the council, then controlled five to two by Democrats, to put a charter amendment on the ballot to create a 13 member council with seven elected by district and six at large. Mayor Sensenbrenner supported the amendment. The Franklin County Democratic Party remained neutral. The Franklin County Republican Party opposed the amendment. The arguments made in that 1968 campaign would sound very familiar to you today. Those in favor cited greater representation of neighborhoods and a better chance for the little guy to get elected. Those opposed cited efficiency of government and the principle espoused in the 1914 charter proposal of every council person being responsible to every voter. The charter proposal was defeated by a 60-40 ratio. Across the th city's 36 wards at the time, it carried in seven wards and was defeated in 29 wards. The seven wards voting in favor were all concentrated in the minority neighborhoods of the east side and in the Ohio State University area. And if I may depart from my prepared remarks just for context, uh, you may recall the late 60s were very tumultuous times, tumultuous in our uh, minority neighborhoods in many areas of the country and here tumultuous on our campuses. Uh, the Democratic majority on council, which had just uh, taken over council in the 1965 elections, were very, very cognizant that here the African American community was a very important part of the Democratic coalition and yet the city council was an all-white city council and had been all-white since 1916. So you had a, a strong element of consideration, how are we going to get minorities elected to their city council since they hadn't been elected uh, since prior to uh, 1916, prior to the 1940 Charter Amendment. And so some Democrats, especially some of the ones who consider themselves more progressive like Jim Bauman, proposed this hybrid council of at large and districts to be responsive to some of these concerns um, uh, of the African American community uh, within the Democratic coalition. Um, you might, it might also be note, uh, worthy to know that one month prior to that May 68 vote, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on April 4th of 1968, culminating the type of racial animosity and unrest that existed in our country. So every election is conducted within a context of social forces and social conditions, and those were the social forces and so social conditions at play when Columbusites went to the polls in May of uh, 1968 to decide whether to change the structure of city council. Seven years later, in 1975, Democrats in control of council once again put another hybrid proposal on the ballot. This charter proposal called not for a 13-member council but an 11-member council with six members elected by ward and five at large. The Democratic candidate for mayor Dr. John H. Roseman, who was the first African-American to be a major party uh, nominee for uh, council, championed the issue of a hybrid council. The Republican incumbent, uh, Mayor Tom Moody, at the time running for a second term as mayor, opposed it. The arguments for and against resembled those of 1968 and resembled those of today. And the proposed amendment failed by the exact same ratio, 60-40. As it, it failed by the same ratio it had seven years previously. And if you look at the ward map, the ward by ward results, interestingly enough, support for the amendment was concentrated pretty much in the same wards where it was concentrated in 1968. The city had grown to 59 wards by that time. 13 of the wards went for the proposal, the rest went against it. All the wards that went for the proposal were concentrated either on the east side, the university district, or in Linden area. So there was a strong uh, racial uh, divide in the city in both elections. Uh, Chairwoman Co, members of the council, um, I'm privileged to try to share some historical perspective with you. Uh, this question of the optimum structure of city council, as you can see, is one that persists over time. The question is never permanently settled. It needs to be examined anew from time to time in the light of new realities, new circumstances of an ever-changing city. It is never permanently answered, and that is exactly as Jefferson intended. I commend you for your study. 
I hope this historical overview is, is of some help, and I would be try to I would be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions? Please, Bob. Mike, do you know is there any evidence in from 1916 when this was put into place that it was done for the purpose of limiting representation of ethnic minorities and racial minorities? If there's any evidence, uh, committee member Vitale, that, that this proposal was intended to limit minority influence, I have not run across it. Um, the deliberations of the Charter Review Commission were open uh, at the time. They were covered by the newspapers. Um, the commission was were led by two people who were widely esteemed uh, across the city. Um, it, I, it, my view of the reading of history is that this proposed charter was seen as being with the progressive era reform spirit to uh, clean up city council. And then in, when this was first on the ballot in 1968, Mayor Sensenbrenner supported it, and he was a Democrat. Correct. Did the, who, which party was in control of council then? Do you know? The Democrats were in control of council, but okay. the Democratic Party was split. You'll be shocked okay. to know there were factions within the party <laughs> <What>? <laughs> back then. The, there was a Democratic faction um, that was sort of referred to um, sometimes admirably, sometimes not so admirably as the Irish Mafia. The, those forces within City Hall supported the proposal. The people who were running the county party, at least on, the, at a, on a titular basis, weren't so enamored of the proposal. And so the, the County Democratic Party stayed neutral. And Sensenbrenner, if you go back and look at the microfilm, look at the articles in the Dispatch and the Citizen Journal at the time, um, encouraged the Democratic Party to stay neutral. He, he, he didn't lobby them for their support. Um, his rhetoric uh, in the papers was, we want this to be above politics. We want this to be above partisanship. This is about good government, and we, we ought not pit Democrats and Republicans, we ought not try to make it a partisan issue. Now, I did not know Mayor Sensenbrenner. I can't interpret his comments beyond what I read in the newspaper um, to, um, to, to give you layers of analysis on uh, where he was coming from, but th that was his public pitch. And in 1975, did the parties, the candidates for mayor were on either side, but were the parties, did they take a stand? In 1975, um, Dr. John H. Roseman pretty much spoke for the party on the issue. Uh, the party was largely supportive of uh, the hybrid plan. The Republican Party, again, uh, was formally opposed, as was incumbent Mayor Tom Moody. Other questions? Yes. Um, Mr. Curtin, thank you for this historical um, perspective, and I have to say I remembered some of this. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> so it did bring back some memories. Um, this is maybe not be a question for you, but for our, our chair. Could we have uh, the same analysis from the last uh, issue one vote, the way you, you just, just determine which ward supported it? I'm not asking you to provide that, but I'm asking if we could follow this same last paragraph that Mr. Curtin provided, which areas supported it and which did not. But I, I really appreciate this uh, historical perspective. Thank you very much. I believe we have that information, so we'll make sure it's shared at a future meeting, if not before. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great point. Thank yes, you very please. much. Oh, I think we have more oh, questions. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Curtin, uh, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Curtin, um, you've uh, done a lot of work on historical uh, perspectives in the state government. And I have, I think, all versions of your Ohio politics book at home, well-worn, and it's a very good source of information. Um, I think one of the things that you've tracked at the state level over the years 
is uh, campaign finance expenditures by various candidates. Um, I think you did for statewides in at least a couple of versions of, of that book. Have, have you looked at campaign finance in, at the city level at all? Is there any data that you have worked, uh, looked at in that area? Committee Member Mills, I have not. Um, back in my days of covering City Hall and, and being a local politics reporter, I regularly uh, research the, fi the, the filings at the Board of Elections, the, uh, the campaign expenditure reports, and routinely wrote about them, but I have not kept up with that practice for a long, long time. Um, I'd be in a time warp if I uh, even venture to guess. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Any other questions? Any questions from anyone in attendance tonight? Okay. Representative Curtin, we really appreciate your time and information you shared. And if any of our members who are absent tonight have questions, we, we will probably be in contact, maybe email them to you or something so that we can try to get those answered as well. Your willingness to serve this is important, a very important subject. And if I can provide any more background down the road, I'm happy to do so. Thank, Thank you for you having so me. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And our second presentation tonight, Edward Johnson, um, Council's liaison to our committee, um, will be addressing some of the various structures of city governments throughout Ohio and looking at some of the data. Again, I believe this data was emailed out to the committee members prior to tonight um, and should be in the folders as well, I believe. Yes. Okay. It should be the long legal sheet that's folded in half yes. in your uh, folders. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Co. Uh, my name is Edward Johnson, Director of Legislative Affairs for Council. Um, and additionally, um, as a note, my uh, testimony and uh, State Representative Curtains will be available on the website tomorrow as well for members of the public who would like to see that. Um, Chair Co. asked staff to offer an overview of the structures of municipal government throughout the United States and uh, to provide committee members with data on the top 15 largest cities in Ohio uh, and lastly, to offer a brief overview of how Columbus City Council works, how it operates and functions. So uh, first, an overview of forms of municipal government uh, with an acknowledgement of the assistance of the National League of Cities for providing much of this information. Um, the first form I'll introduce members to is mayor council form of government, which is the category Columbus falls into. Uh, the primary characteristics of a mayor council government include uh, the mayor is elected separate from the council. He's oft, he or she is often full-time and paid with significant administrative and budgetary authority. Uh, depending on the municipal charter, the mayor could have weak or strong powers. In Columbus's case, we have a strong mayor system. Uh, strong mayors are the chief executives of cities and centralize the executive power in their office. Uh, this is to say the mayor directs the administrative structure, appoints and removes department heads, has veto powers, and the council does not oversee the daily operation of city government. In a weak mayor system, there's a more powerful council uh, with both legislative and executive authorities. So the mayor is not truly the chief executive officer and has very limited or no veto powers. Um, the council in a weak mayor system can prevent the mayor from effectively supervising city administration, and there may be many administrative boards and commissions that operate independent of city government. Um, characteristics shared by strong and weak mayors is that the council is elected and maintains legislative powers, and some cities, like uh, one of our sister cities to the south, Cincinnati, appoints a professional manager who maintains limited administrative authority. Uh, mayor council form of government is used in 34% of cities surveyed by the International City County Management Association, making it the second most common form of government, city government. It's found in mostly older, larger cities and in very small cities, um, and is most popular in the mid-Atlantic and Midwest. New York, Houston, Salt Lake City, Minneapolis are examples, examples of mayor council cities. The next form is the council manager system. Several cities throughout Ohio use the council manager system as well as several peer cities that Columbus tends to benchmark, its, benchmark itself against. Uh, for the purposes of this committee and its scope, however, it should be noted that Columbus is neither a council manager 
form of government, nor is the committee being asked to consider a change to that effect. Um, accordingly, the differences in council responsibilities will show that a comparison between a city that employs council manager and Columbus is not apples to apples. Um, characteristics of the council manager form of government include city council overseeing the general administration, making policy, and setting the budget. Uh, council appoints a professional city manager to carry out day-to-day -day administrative operations, and the mayor is chosen from among council members on a rotating basis to serve a ceremonial role. Large peer cities that use a council manager form of government are Phoenix and San Antonio. Uh, lastly, I'll briefly remark on the commission form of government, which has some degree of popularity in southwest Ohio, uh, in addition to one of Columbus's major peer cities, Portland. The commission form of government is the oldest form of government, city government in the United States. However, it is present in less than 1% of cities, mostly with populations below 100,000. Characteristics of the commission form of government include voters electing individual commissioners to a small governing board. Each commissioner is responsible for one specific aspect of city business, such as fire, police, public works, health, finance, etc. Uh, one commissioner is designated as the chair, sometimes called a mayor, and presides over the meetings. And uh, the commission basically has legislative and executive functions vested in itself. Uh, the Columbus City Charter provides for a mayor council form of government with a strong mayor. This explanation is not provided to preclude members from looking at the size and structure of city councils around the nation that do not fall in that category, rather to provide useful information on how members analyze the data being presented and understand that there may be a city or cities that we admire and look to, however their form of government may necessitate a certain size or form. Um, the second piece of information members should be aware of when looking at research that will be provided or has been provided is that several cities employ a city-county consolidated government, which is different from the context Columbus is in. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau identifies 34 city-county consolidated governments out of 3,069 county governments in the country. Uh, the cities that this information applies to that you should be aware of moving forward are the city and county of San Francisco, California, the city and county of Denver, Nashville-Davidson County, the county of Duval and the city of Jacksonville, the county of Marion and the city of Indianapolis, the county of Jefferson and the city of Louisville. Uh, City-county consolidations are attempts at metropolitan reorganization for one of many reasons depending on local context. Uh, for example, the city of Jacksonville consolidated with Duval County in 1968 after the industrial city center declined. With population shifting to the suburbs, the tax base was completely eroded. Its services overlapped with other governments in the area. And additionally, uh, in the 60s, three major scandals led the city to reorganize with an elected chief executive and a 19-member council. Additionally, we can look at uh, the city and county of San Francisco's consolidation in 1900 as the result of residents seeking to remedy the city of San Francisco's ails of enormous debt and taxation, which was deterring capital investment and leading to population flight from the city of San Francisco at the time. Consolidating with the more frugal and economic county of San Francisco provided the remedy to an impending fiscal crisis and gave California its only city council consolidated government to this day. I mention these examples because it's just worth noting that major events in local politics lead to a city county consolidation with peculiar local sensitivities being catered to in the formation of that new government. Accordingly, when we look at those city county consolidated governments, we have to do so with the knowledge that further historical context is probably required to explain certain attributes of those governments. Um, lastly, I will further note that not all major cities have home rule authority. They cannot decide how to shape their government. Uh, while many have state constitutional factors that directly limit the ability of municipalities to craft local solutions for government structure and form of election. For example, Chicago, Boston, and Memphis 
are ruled by a Byzantine collection of state constitution, state law, quasi-home rule, and local charter provisions. Other states like Indiana and South Carolina do not provide home rule for any of their cities as we do in Ohio. Um, moving on to the Ohio experience, um, you've been provided with a spreadsheet outlining the characteristics of the, branch, of the legislative branches of Ohio's 15 largest cities. The list provides members with information on the form of government, council structure, council size, and meeting frequency for cities ranging in size from 50,000 to over three quarters of a million, mayor council, council manager, and commission manager forms of government, and at-large hybrid and district-based councils. As members can see, 13 of 15 cities in Ohio use the mayor council form of government, with Dayton and Springfield of Southwest Ohio being notab notable users of the commission manager form. Uh, nine cities employ a hybrid structure of, re of representation, five elect members at large, with one city electing members from districts exclusively. It's, noticeable, it's notable that Ohio's three largest cities, Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati, are not in the majority of cities using hybrid forms of representation. Columbus and Cincinnati elect all of their members at large, while Cleveland is the one major Ohio city to elect all members from districts. Additionally, Cleveland stands alone in being the only legislative body to have a variable number of municipal legislators based upon city population. Uh, historically, I would also note that Cincinnati has a storied history with its charter and municipal government, producing the longest running third party in American politics to have elected officials continually elected to office, the Charter Party or Charter Committee. Uh, this was established in 1924. The Charter Committee was a, dir a direct response to the Boss Cox era of city politics, where the city of Cincinnati had a 32-member council, with six of those seats being reserved for at-large election. In 1924, the year of the Charter Party's founding, Cincinnati City Council was split between 31 Republicans and one Democrat, orchestrated by Boss Cox lead protege, Rudolf Heinecke. Leading to the adoption of the new city charter, the Charterites brought Cincinnati a council manager form of government, a civil service bureaucracy, and a nine-member, nonpartisan nine non city council. Those at-large members are served by the city's 52 community councils covering all 80 square miles of the city to this day. Cleveland's history is also notable. Prior to home rule, Cleveland City Council varied in size between six and 40. Once home rule was introduced in 1912, Cleveland's charter gave the city a ward-based 26-member council. The electors of Cleveland would fundamentally change their charter in 1921 and move to a council manager system. In addition to adding three council members, moving total membership to 29. Two years later, four additional members would be added, raising the total number to 33 within 10 years of adopting home rule. By 1931, council manager system was abandoned in Cleveland, but the 33 member council persisted. 20 years later, in 1951, Cleveland reduced the size of its council from 33 to 21. And in 2008, the electors of Cleveland once again instituted further change to their charter relative to their city council introducing the population-based system, ensuring a council between 11 and 25. Current C Cleveland City Council has 17 members with a decennial review after every census. Uh, lastly, as you deliberate, I have to note that Akron, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, Elyria, Hamilton, Kettering, Lakewood, Springfield, Toledo, and Youngstown are all home rule cities, as outlined by the city attorney's chief counsel, Josh Cox, uh, at our last meeting. The other cities, Canton, Lorraine, and Parma, are statutory cities under Ohio law, making them subject to state legislative changes to their form of government. Uh, lastly, specifically as it relates to Columbus City Council, we have a mayor council form of government, as you've heard me say, with a strong mayor. City Council has seven seats, all elected at large. While Columbus is a strong mayor, mayor council form of government, Council maintains legislative authority under the classical separation of powers. Council is responsible for enacting the laws of the city and appropriating the money necessary to operate the government, 
through its role in deliberating and taking action on the mayor's budget when it is submitted. Additionally, City Council makes land use decisions through its zoning committee. In those regards, Council is an equal partner with the mayor and the governing of Columbus. Uh, council members must be residents of the city for at least a year prior to election. They must maintain that residency throughout their term of service. They may not hold any other public office except notary public or member of Armed, Fo Armed Forces Reserve Unit. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, members of council serve four-year terms on a staggered basis. So four are typically elected in one election cycle and three in another. So you don't, you can never really change council all at once. Um, and elect, they elect a president and a president pro tempore from amongst their membership. Uh, the council president organizes and appoints the members to, to the committee structure of council. The committee structure organizes legislation and provides a division of labor to give executive departments an appropriate level of oversight. Currently, city council has 18 committees to cover a variety of policy areas from public safety to development to utilities to zoning. Each council member chairs at least one standing committee. I believe each member chairs at least two currently, some three and some, I believe one chairs four committees. Uh, once organized, council acts through legislation, which takes one of two forms, resolution or ordinance. Resolution expresses the view of council on a topic while ordinance directs specific action to be taken. Enacting new law requires action by council and one other branch of city government. Oftentimes, executive departments are requesting authorization to do something, and so the agency submits that ordinance or resolution to council for review. Other times, council members in their capacity as legislators enact a new policy after consultation with the community and the executive branch. After adoption of a resolution or passage of an ordinance, the legislation is sent to the mayor, who may veto. Checks and balances allow council to override a mayoral veto or the mayor may return legislation unsigned, in which case it becomes law 10 days later. Uh, council is supported in its work by two staffers assigned to each member in a pool of support staff for communications, research, and community engagement functions. Uh, it's my hope that this presentation has provided members with the tools to understand how to evaluate cities, city councils, legislative branches, and to provide you with some understanding of governance and how Columbus City Council operates so. In subsequent meetings, you'll receive research from us on national peer cities and benchmark cities based on size, growth rate, similarities, and their place on the best cities index and other factors and any cities that committee members might ask us to also look at. So thank you for your time and I'm free to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Please. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, do you know which peer cities nationally you propose to use in your research to? Um, I can, as an illustrative list, we'll look at cities like Portland, like Austin, because of their size and their similarities. Um, we'll look at Indianapolis as well. Um, we'll probably also take a look at some of the larger cities, uh, just so we have an anchor like Chicago. Um, but these will be cities kind of geographically diverse, um, but we're gonna try to look for cities of a similar size, which that sweet spot is probably Austin, San Francisco, Portland, possibly Jacksonville. Um, and so that's, that's kind of an illustrative list, but we can also provide you with kind of a list. There are various lists that say these are typically benchmark cities that other organizations look at as well when compared to what? So you'll go some larger and some, like, you know, some yes. of, okay. We'll try to stay in the top 50, top 100, though. Thank you. Other questions, please. I'm sort of curious about the metric involved here. I'll uh, hazard a guess that we can, f well, first of all, I don't know what a good city is, how you measure it. And, and I suppose it's somewhat linked to the, uh, hmm, the, um, economic climate in the city um, and I'll hazard a guess that we're not going to find a great correlation between a district form, pure district form, a pure at large form, a hybrid form that marries up perfectly with the economic health of the city. It, I suspect we're going to find that uh, 
the, there's going to be some pure districts that are doing well and some that are doing miserably and it'll apply across. So I, don't, I, I, I appreciate all this. It's very interesting. I, I don't know what the metric is that lets us make any decisions from it. Uh, I guess I would sort of hazard the guess that uh, we each have our own DNA and DNA is an apt term because I think it's a product of our, an of our ancestors. And I suspect we're going to find here that uh, most of these places simply made their DNA work. If they were born into a district form, they made it work. If they were born into an at-large, they made it work. Um, and so I, I think this is lovely. Uh, I just, I, I'm having trouble with the metric uh, to, to make decisions. Um, so I don't, I don't know how we look at this differently, take the wheels off and put it back on in a different way and, and think about it, but um, is, is there any, any metric of citizen satisfaction? A definitive metric used consistently across all cities, I would have to say that I'm not aware of one. Um, and so some of this will be left to the committee to divine after receiving uh, data and community input to say, we feel that, as you said, Columbus's history is here. This is where we currently are. And we see that there are some of our peer cities, and I would say most closely cities like Indianapolis and Austin, to say, well, this is who they are, this is what they've done, and this is where they're going, and how do we feel about that? And how does the community feel about that? opposite because I too agree what, how do you get a metrics we've kind of talked about this I mean you can look at things like bond rating or or uh, to your point some have been successful and some have probably been unsuccessful but I almost feel like at least I started looking at it from the opposite so if the goal is or the question I guess you would say is what do we change this to I, I still want to know why change it so what which of these forms along the same way would be better which of these forms would produce a better result? And then we have to decide what that result is. You know, what's that thing we're looking for um, to change it? I guess that's, that's sort of where I would come from. You know, if, if you're gonna change something, kind of understanding what value that change is gonna bring. And, because uh, I think this is very hard to have a, a, a metrics. I mean, that, that would make this a lot more uh, logical <laughs> if we could put some rankings or some numbers. And so I think, you know, we probably have to, think about some of those things that we want to say are the metrics we would use and, and, and see what we can find if there is anything. But it's definitely the idea I struggle with and made a note of, um, you know, what is the thing we're looking for when you try to compare these, um, you know, put it into a spreadsheet. And I think it gives you great data, but I'm not sure exactly what we compare. And the one question I had sort of related to that was, do we have any data on how often these cities are changing their, their form of government? You referenced some with the city of Cleveland in, in, in your testimony, but I'd be curious how often th they're being changed. Um, that's something that we could provide as additional research for all of the 15 cities. Um, most of the time when we look at peer cities within the state of Ohio, we are looking to Cleveland and Cincinnati, and so that's why I wanted to provide that specific historical context, but we could look into, uh, for example, why does Toledo have a 12-member city council? Even numbers in deliberative bodies are very odd. Um, and so we can provide some of that additional historical context and research um, as members would like. I was just thinking about it in the sense of, did those cities use something as the reason for change? Um, and I think it's clear that some kind of um, society, political, um, I don't want to say upheaval, but change based upon Representative Curtin's testimony triggered some of these events. So I'd be curious what has triggered cities to make a change. Um, you know, if they've been able to come up with some statistical data, or if this was more um, the community-driven. Because I guess in part I'm thinking we have a community. Our citizens have now voted three times to defeat a change um, to the structure. So. If these were driven from community issues, you know, that seems like our community has spoken pretty clearly about that. So I'd kind of want to understand how often or if there is any data on why they made changes. I think that'd be interesting to try to look at. We, staff will make that available, um, hopefully by our next meeting. Any other questions? 
Yes, please. Start to think out uh, loud, always a dangerous thing to do. Um, I started to go where you went, and, and that is, is, well, what are, if people are changing, what are they changing to? And then I got to worry about whether or not there were flavors of the day that maybe were made on, on an irrational basis. And then I backed into the conclusion that maybe things change because the economic climate of a city ain't all that hot. Uh -huh. So I don't know that, uh, again, I, I'm trying to tease this apart, go in the same place you are. Well, oh, people are changing. Let's, what are they changing to? Let's see what's going on. Yeah. But, uh, but what's the motivation? Uh -huh. And if it's the economic health of the municipality, uh, again, that's sort of devoid from the, the structure, it seems to me. That's a, that's a result of macro and microeconomics. Yeah. Um, not much cause and effect. So I, we've got a tough one here. We've got a tough one. Thank you. Absolutely. Other comments or questions from the committee members? Any questions or comments from anyone in attendance? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I got ahead of myself earlier. We were going to talk about the announcement of future meeting dates uh, from the agenda. I think we already kind of covered that, but I will just reiterate that our next meeting is Thursday, October 27th. And um, I I guess, again, I would encourage anyone um, here or, or watching that this is the opportunity for people to provide comments. We're getting into topics about the size of council, um, wards, districts, those kinds of, of conversations. And obviously the point of this was to give every citizen an opportunity or any citizen who had questions, comments, concerns, suggestions to have an opportunity to voice those. So the more comments we can get, whether it's submitted online or in attendance to ask questions or make statements would be fantastic. So would really encourage anyone to do that. I don't believe we had any additional speaker slips for tonight, but is there anyone in attendance who would like to address the committee? Are they thinking about it maybe? Okay. Anyone on the committee want to make any comments, raise any issues, please? This is just a general comment, and I'm not sure who said it. I'm not sure if you said it, John, or you, but you, we were talking about satisfaction. You were talking about the economic environment, and I think you may find when you look at the research, there's usually some reason why there was the initiative to change. Um, some may be legal um, challenges uh, that you may want to acknowledge. Uh, but in general, you know, are people happy? And how do we measure that? And I know we've made some changes within the um, city administration. We have our area commissions. We have, I know, the initiatives of the different uh, representatives around the city. I'm not sure what the names are called. They're, not resource, but you know, the different uh, staff members that represent certain areas of the city. The neighborhood liaisons. The lia liaisons, yeah. yes, that's it, thank you. So I don't know if there's any type of customer satisfaction or any information that's coming up through those channels that would be some general information for the committee. You know, a touch point. You know, this isn't all you know, scientific, but it would just be a, a touch point since we have all of these outreach for the city. Thank you. So just a general, there's no timeline on that, but I'd be interested. Yes, sir. You want to, if you could just state your name, um, but from the microphone so we can all hear you. Thank you. And if you represent any specific organization, please state that as well. My name is Will Petrick, and I'm actually not representing a specific organization this evening. I'm a resident of the Old North neighborhood, I live at 350 East Tompkins. Um, I would just, I guess, offer an idea in terms of what is the criteria at which we judge the, the quality of, of our local government. I think 
particularly in the, the national context right now, so many people feel like our democracy is broken, that big money has kind of completely overrun our politics um, with, with Citizens United and also in Columbus, one of the things I'm hoping this, this group will talk about is campaign contribution limits, because in Columbus, we don't have any campaign contribution limits at the local level. Uh, so in kind of this era of like big money in politics, for me at least as a member of the community, the, the criteria is do people feel like they actually have a voice? It's, it's as simple as that. I think there's a lot of people that feel like big developers, corporate CEOs, you know, the Columbus Partnership, a lot of these um, groups that can get people elected to office have, have a say in the direction of our neighborhoods, in the direction of our city. And a, a lot of people just don't feel like, you know, our, our participation matters. I think it's unfortunate this was all about like getting neighborhood input and citizen input and it's kind of like reflective here there's like not a lot of people here so um that's and and i want to say thank you all for your service that isn't reflective at all of of you know i, I i'm glad that this process is happening uh but i do feel like there's a lot of just everyday people out there that don't know how to don't know how to lift up the goals that we have for our neighborhoods and for our city. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Yes, please. I really appreciate that, that, that comment. Absolutely. Got me thinking a little bit. So do people, um, I mean, one of, one of, one of the ways we, we talk to our people are when we vote. Um, and do people vote because they're happy, because they're mad? Um, it, it, for instance, if we looked at populations and voter participation, you know, voter registration and then voter, uh, voter participation, w would some pattern appear where it looked like, I mean, would we eventually conclude that if people are, th think they're having an effect, they show up and vote? or if they feel that it's beyond their power, they don't bother to show up. I mean, is there, is there something we can tease out of this that lets us sort of identify places where people are, are registering and then in fact showing up and voting, presumably because they think that, they, that they're being heard and it makes a difference that they're being heard and that they're choosing representatives that are, are you know, try, trying to do what they want them to do. Um, is, is that a possible insight into sort of satisfaction with government? I don't, I don't know the answer to this, but it's, it's a notion, something to, to look at. I definitely don't know the answer to that either, but it may be a topic that we can think about whether or not there's a, a way to look at. I think that's the point. We're all trying to struggle with what's the thing or things that um, can help. And I, I think I would just echo part of um, what the speaker said that you know, this is an opportunity for as many people as possible to have a chance to express their opinions and participate, and hopefully we'll continue to see more people come. Um, I think that will help a committee like this make a more informed decision if we have more input um, than, than not. So hopefully we'll continue to see more people. I, we could really overwhelm staff with these harebrained yes. ideas, you understand. <laughs> uh, it'd be sort of neat to maybe just to identify so-called three peer cities and just sort of look at the question of population, registration, voter participation. This is, you know, it tells us whether or not it's worth picking at it some more, maybe. Yeah. I think at this point we're still in the uh, information gathering, so we need to throw out all of these ideas and some of them may work and some may not, so I appreciate that. Any other comments or concerns tonight? Oh, yes, sir, sorry, Bob. Is, is a topic like campaign finance some part within our purview? I don't is that so. structure of council or? Uh, I mean, I think we have some element of flexibility, but in general, no, it's not within the specific okay. um, scope of what we were asked to look at. I believe campaign finance issues are by charter can now be addressed by council itself. I don't believe it's a charter amendment. Can someone help me say this better? Uh, Madam Chair, committee member Vitali, uh, the charter authorizes city council to address these issues through ordinance. 
and so it would not constitute a charter change. Council, at its council, could presumably at any time introduce an ordinance to this effect. I guess I would add to that that I think we have a limited scope in particular, but as we've discussed all along, every comment's being submitted. So if campaign finance related issues are something that are still a concern, we can always add a note that city council look at that issue. Because I think the point is it doesn't require a charter amendment. It would be an issue that city council can address through its regular course of business. Um, any other questions, concerns? Yeah. Madam Chair. Oh, one second. Sorry. I, You're I'm, confused well, by. You no, no, no. I, I say. I, 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 thank you. Thank you, Brett. I, I just said I'm confused by uh, the, the response. Um, the question of how this works is a blend of things that council can change and things that require a charter revision. Uh, uh, I, I don't know whether to interpret the response that if in fact it can be done through ordinance that is out and that we're limited to simply things that are affected through a change in charter. I, I don't understand that response. I don't know if it's workable, to be perfectly frank. Well, I do, I guess I do. clarify that. I mean, Thank you. We, we don't necessarily, this committee doesn't necessarily have to address only things that are charter amendments. I mean, we could ultimately recommend things that may be process changes, maybe ordinances. We have a variety. But I think when council and the mayor's office put this committee together, there was a limited scope of what they wanted us to address. Campaign finance related issues and ultimately campaign finance reform were not part of that list. Um, so I think if we, I believe that's defined even in the bylaws. I was trying to quickly look through paper, but um, so I think my point is though that I'm assuming we're going to receive comments on other topics, as we've kind of said, out of the scope, in the scope. But I think at the end of the day, if that's a topic that we think needs further exploration, we should recommend further exploration of that topic. I also think the point is it doesn't require a charter or amendment. So if there's a group of citizens or p members of this committee that want to address that issue, council can address that issue without a charter amendment. Yeah, I, I wasn't troubled by the notion that it wasn't in the scope. I was troubled by the notion that uh, what we offered up might not be a blend of practice, ordinance, charter revisions, It would ethic. absolutely be. <laughs> what well, we also well, recommend whole should be that whole, yeah. whole list of things. I'm yeah. sure there will be things we recommend as charter amendments, as procedure, ordinances, et cetera. Uh, just around the, the same uh, topic, while currently the charter gives the council authority, uh, certainly the charter could be amendment, amended to put together a regime of how it should take place in the future. In other words, we could recommend, the citizens could vote on a charter amendment that would create a campaign finance uh, regime, even though it's currently with uh, the, the uh, council, I don't see why we couldn't recommend a charter change to, to do that. that. Technically, we could recommend a charter change. That the charter could be amended to change the process that currently says council can make ordinances. I agree. I do think that within the scope, as we ultimately look at what were the tasks we were specifically asked to look at, I don't think that's in there. But you know, we'll go through this process and I guess kind of see where the key issues are. Um, you know, I think we were asked to address the size of council, whether wards or districts were the right answer, the, the appointment or vacancy filling process, and I'm not sure you know, how directly campaign finance related issues, I understand they touch all of that, but how that specifically is addressed. So, okay. clearly an issue we should think about. So, any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, well then we will have a motion to adjourn tonight. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Fantastic. Anyone opposed? We will see everyone. I know. We will see everyone on October 27th. We appreciate you all coming.